Tonight there is mourning on the campus of UC Santa Barbara. The loss of six students gunned down on campus Friday night in a senseless tragedy at the hands of a fellow student. Police say the gunman planned the attack for three years while he was being treated by therapists. Authorities say he posted threatening messages in online forums and even tried to push women off of a ledge at a local bar. His parents, they called the police. However, they said he didn't meet the legal criteria for involuntary psychiatric hospitalization. He was also prescribed medications, which he refused to take. An article in the Times points to a 2002 report by the Secret Service on school shootings, saying in part, quote, warning signs about disturbed individuals preparing for some kind of mass attack are almost always present, but often do not come to the attention of the authorities, end quote. And as we saw in this case here, information was brought to the authorities. However, legalities prevented anything from being done about it. And again, um, I want to bring back our panel. In addition to Dr. Kelleher, we are joined. Jonathan Yaden, Jonathan, Democratic consultant with the Advance Group and a former executive director with the Kings County Democratic Party. Dominic Carter, of course, political journalist and author. And Andrew Whitman, our senior political correspondent. Um, is it the impression for many on the outside is that hurdle we were just talking about before the break is too high? Um, that the authorities are often the last to know, those closest know the level of problems. Again, in this scenario, person over the age of 18, is that hurdle too high here, or do you think it's where it needs to be for privacy protections and everything else? Well, the law really speaks to the uh, people on the extreme end. If you feel that someone's uh, clearly at risk, you must report them, for example, and, and that's fine, but there's a lot of uh, gray that, that comes into play, and it's hard to legislate that in fairness. Um, I think that today with uh, social media, we're entering a new age where there's more means of communication. Perhaps there's a possibility of more interception of people's planning ahead of time. I'm, I'm not sure, but yep. it, it, you'd wonder about that. Uh, and in addition to that, unfortunately, because of the uh, growth of the uh, social media and computing technologies and technologies in general, there might be a potential for one person to do more damage than, than in previous years. You know, Andrew, we talk a lot on this program, um, seen the last year, uh, not just about these kind of stories, but also on the other end about privacy and how so often our privacy rights are um, seemingly chipped away here and there. But at the same end, I found myself really conflicted here because you can't force people <coughs> to get help unless this is a definable threat. But at the same end, if we could figure out a way that if somebody is troubled, just take the guns away, even temporarily until either we get them the right amount of help or we just decide that they are a threat to society. And I know it's really easy for me to paint with big crayons on this one. This is a detail issue and I'm trying to have it both ways. But on the same end, what's the same com commonalities we have? Troubled person, a record here, um, whether it be anecdotal or tangible of being you know, very disturbed, access to guns and tragic loss of life. If we can get that middle part of the equation out of the picture, when at least we identify these folks, we're talking about different stories on today's like now. You know, we have we've had a checkered history when it comes to mental health and mental illness in this country, and, and people the threshold for involuntary commitment is high for a reason, and I don't think anybody argues that it should be lessened in this case. The common denominator here are the guns. It's not there are people who have mental illness who are perfectly nonviolent or who don't have access to guns and can't act on anything. The the problem is the guns, and we come back to the old saw that. It, people don't kill, guns don't kill people, people kill people. No, the guns kill people. And if you, if you make it harder for them to get the guns, then you're going to have a lower body count and you'll be able to get people better treatment uh, as the process goes. But it's, the guns were legally sold here, Dom. Uh, they were, he went through the proper, this is, this is California, this isn't Mississippi or something. Mm -hmm. He didn't have any record. Um, there was nothing in his sheet in effect that would say that he should have been red flagged here before he bought it. So unless we're going to change the policy where you have to do like a driver's test, some form of application to purchase a gun, which I can't imagine seeing in my lifetime, even if I think it should be tougher. Again, on this one, I, I just don't, I just know we're going to be doing this story again. Maybe it'll be a grammar school, maybe it'll be a high school, maybe another college campus. I yeah. just know that history, unfortunately, is on my side here, that we're going to be doing the story all over again. And it, it just drives me nuts. We can't come up with a way to try and cut this off at the pass a little bit. Well, un unfortunately, your assessment is correct. We mm. are going to go down this path again and again and again. And until 
Well, one of the greatest injustices in our country today, the dollars for the mental health community, in my opinion, are not there. Elected officials, if it's not an issue that really stands out to them, yeah. they ignore it. They don't pay attention to it. It becomes easy to cut. That's what we're dealing with now. And when you talk about having someone uh, placed in the hospital for a 48-hour, uh, I don't know if they still do those, doctor, but a 48-hour, you know, you, right, you've got to have a professional do that because it's such a slippery slope. Are we now going to put that added pressure, in which it basically is, on police officers to become a mental health expert? They were there as recent as, I believe, Friday night at, at the young man's place. They did not notice anything. We know they were there recently. They didn't notice anything outside the ordinary. Apparently, the weapons were inside. But, but Richard, how, how are we going to carry this out? Who's going to be the judge that's going to decide whether your freedom, my freedom, his is taken away? at the drop of a dime. Who's going to make that decision? Unless you're a doctor. Who else is going to make that decision? That's the problem. And we've seen here, this one is a little tougher, but we've seen cases where even elected officials, do you remember the name, Andrew, I think now Senator? He tried to have his son institutionalized. They couldn't keep him there for an extended period of time. I believe Virginia. Somebody yeah, I believe in Virginia. Was, uh, yeah, Dean, exactly. And then yeah, the son yeah. took a knife to his father the next right. day, uh, right. almost killed him, and, and, the, and the child, unfortunately, dead. My, my point is, uh, you know, people don't want to hear some of the hard truths. He said it himself, the doctor's being played here, but you have an underfunded mental health uh, industry right now. That wasn't necessarily the case here. The kid came from a family of means. But it's just so hard to keep guns out of people's hands unless it's so out there. Um, and you even know what the lobby, they'll even fight people with, you know, uh, you know, with felons uh, or people that have had uh, restraining orders on them. I mean, so I don't know. It's just the yeah. inevitability of this kind of story is the most depressing thing to me. Absolutely. And we are going to hear about it again. Unfortunately, there isn't one, for lack of a better term, silver bullet here to solve this problem. I mean, there are several different things. Raising increased funding for mental health aware is one aspect of it. Retraining and properly training police officers to do a better job you know, witnessing and seeing uh, these things and then, you know, acting on them. Um, background checks across the board, absolutely. I mean, some of these things, we're never going to, as you said, I mean, it's just not going to happen, unfortunately, due to the political climate and due to, you know, the, the, uh, the NRA in particular. But things have to get done here, and if we, th we have to do the things we can do. And we might not be able to pass, you know, a, a more stringent background check on a federal, national level, but if we can raise funding for mental, uh, uh, mental health, and we are able to do other things. These are all things that chip away, that hopefully end up, uh, let us end up we, in a better the, place. We have the I highest mean. rate of gun violence in the industrial world, and we have the highest rate of mass shootings in the industrial world. Are we more violent than the rest of the world? Do we have more mentally ill people than the rest of the world? Or do we just have more guns and easier access to guns than the rest of the industrialized world? That's the common denominator. Yeah. Is there more, Dr. Finley, that the mental health community, even if a better funded one, could do to prevent these things on the front end? Because uh, there are now questions, well, should the therapist hear more? There's privacy concerns, obviously, between what happens in counseling. But should more flags be raised more frequently when there's troubled people that you know speak, albeit in the privacy of, uh, of that office with the protections that go along with it? Well, it's a, it's a key question. Uh, my sense is that the clinicians are um, uh, extremely uh, attuned to these issues. And in addition to that, uh, they're trying to uh, wrestle with these issues all the time. And uh, it, one of the nice things about this is nothing really nice about the tragedy, but I do think that over time uh, the police have become much more attuned to these issues. They were always, I'm sure, doing a great job for what they have to do, but this became another dimension, and they've become very attuned to mental health issues over time. Schools have become a lot more attuned to these issues. And although these tragedies do continue to happen, I do think that they've raised the bar for what's expected of people in those facilities, and I think that that's a positive step. Well, um, I think we're just starting on this conversation uh, nationally as to where we go from here, but this one, if you ever wanted to figure out a story without any easy solutions, I think this one's it. Um, and uh, we'll, of course, continue to follow. Doctor, thank you very much. I thank appreciate you very the much. time.
All right, the guys will stick around with me as when we come back from break, we'll transition to politics and some news making uh, on that front in the Empire State. The man on your screen, Michael Grimm, he could be in some trouble here. I'm not just talking with the law, but even on the campaign side, we'll tell you the latest for the Staten Island Republicans.